I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Kristen Jacklin. She's a medical anthropologist. Her PhD is from Master University. Uh, she moved to the Duluth campus of the um, University of Minnesota Medical School uh, three and a half years ago, and is Canadian and was raised in a small rural community in um, Canada. She's um, the professor uh, in the Department of Family Medicine and Biobehavior Health, uh, as also the Associate Director of the Memory Keepers Medical Discovery Team. She has expertise in health equity, indigenous aging and health, knowledge translation and exchange, cross-cultural medicine and cultural safety, and uh, has re re uh, her latest uh, publication in press is on um, cognitive assessment of indigenous populations and in innovations in the aging. She's talking to us today on, and you can see the title on your screen. So welcome very much, Kristen. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, hi, everybody. It's nice to be here this afternoon and thanks for taking some time over the lunch hour to uh, join us for this talk. I'll be talking about dementia inequities in indigenous populations and translation of ethnographic community-based participatory research findings to culturally safe dementia care tools. I'd like to take a moment at the start um, for a land acknowledgement. I think no matter where you're joining us from today, um, we are on the traditional uh, lands of Indigenous people who inhabited this continent before us. Um, if you're down in the south of Minnesota, you're on the traditional lands of the Dakota. And up here in the north, where I am in Duluth, we're on the traditional lands of the Ojibwe. I, um, I like to use land acknowledgements um, to dig a little deeper and have it as an opportunity for all of us to reflect on our positions and, and the power of those positions within this institution of the University of Minnesota, and for us to think about how we can honor the ancestors of this land in our everyday work and decision making. So today I'm going to speak to you about dementia research that I've been involved with for about the last 10 years or so. And it's involved collaborations and partnerships with several Indigenous organizations and First Nations communities. I'm going to start by pointing out why dementia has become a research priority and how it's impacting Indigenous communities disproportionately. Then I'll share with you an overview of the research we've been doing. It's kind of like a 30,000 foot view today. Um, and um, also how we go about doing our community based research. I won't get into a lot of detail on, on that, but um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions if there are things that you don't understand. Then I'll take you through some of the results um, from our projects that we conducted in Ontario, Canada. Uh, it'll be a small snapshot of what we learned, but it'll help you understand the type of data that we have and some of the key findings. This idea of translation is something that I'm hoping you can identify throughout the presentation but it'll also be a topic of the last section of, of the presentation. And we'll show you how translation can be a process and a goal in research and how when you do indigenous health research, it's pretty much a constant. Um, and then hopefully, <clears throat> even with all that, we'll have some time for discussion and questions. I like to uh, have my acknowledgements up front in case we lose people towards the end. Um, there's a lot of them. There's um, a lot of projects that are incorporated in today's presentation. So um, I've tried to get everybody represented here. Um, but I especially want to acknowledge Dr. Wayne Worry, who's been a co-investigator on this work since its inception. Dr. Melissa Blind, who served as a coordinator for these projects for the past five years. And Karen Pitawanaquit, who has worked with us as a community-based researcher for over 10 years. So we actually know surprisingly little about the incidence and prevalence of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias in indigenous populations. But we do know that rates of dementia vary by ethnicity and sex. Almost two thirds of Americans with Alzheimer's disease are women. Older African-Americans are about twice as likely to have Alzheimer's or other dementias as older white people. 
Hispanics are about one and a half times as likely to have Alzheimer's or dementia than older whites. But what about American Indian, Native Hawaiians, and Alaskan Natives? There's very limited studies that are published about this, but what is out there uh, suggests that both the incidence and prevalence of dementia are elevated in Indigenous populations. This slide shows the results from a US study using Kaiser Permanente data from California that shows the American Indian Alaskan Native population is second to the African American population and higher than all other ethnicities. There are a handful of international studies that show similar trends in prevalence in Indigenous populations. These are in Canada and Australia. Um, and these are actually particularly good comparison countries because um, they share similar colonial histories and social determinants of health for their Indigenous populations. And so you can see here in the province of Alberta, Canada, uh, Indigenous um, prevalence was higher in the Northern Territory of Australia and the Kimberley region where it was exceedingly high. So while many of us think about dementia as an illness related to genetics or family history, dementia risk is actually largely determined by social environmental factors, which clearly situate it as a disease of health equity. And while the statement on the slide speaks to dementia in African-Americans and Hispanic Latino populations, it's an important statement that recognizes that the cause, causes of dementia are rooted in the social determinants of health. And so just the first sentence of that um, reads, despite some evidence that the influence of genetic risk factors on Alzheimer's and other dementias may differ by race, Genetic factors do not appear to account for the large differences in prevalence or incidence among racial groups. When we talk about risk for dementia, they're divided into two categories, the modifiable and non-modifiable. Non -modifiable. Um, those include genetics and increasing age. And so the genetic side is much more complicated than this. Um, but if we were to simplify it, um, you know, having the APOE allele 4 increases your risk for Alzheimer's disease and uh, risk for earlier onset. Age increases risk, but doesn't cause dementia. So every, after age 65, the risk of Alzheimer's disease doubles every five years. In Indigenous populations, we actually know almost nothing about genetic causes of dementia. We do know, though, that the older Indigenous population is growing more rapidly than the older white population, and that an aging population alone is going to contribute to an increase in the prevalence of dementia in Indigenous populations in the U.S. over the next several decades. There's many factors that may contribute to dementia, but those with the greatest evidence base behind them are captured on this slide. Um, that I've extracted from a 2015 publication in the Alzheimer's and Dementia Journal uh, by Baumgart and colleagues. So you can see here we that sort of in this in the um, strong to moderate evidence base we see traumatic brain injury, midlife obesity, midlife hypertension, current smoking, and diabetes. When we talk about modifiable risk factors in relation to health disparity populations, I like to speak of them as potentially modifiable. Um, that's to recognize that non-majority populations, including indigenous populations, may not have the means to modify um, these kinds of risks. So if we just look at these potentially modifiable factors from the 2015 study, we can see here how in addition to having an increasingly older population, the indigenous populations in the US are at high risk for Alzheimer's disease and dementia due to high rates of associated medical conditions, elevated risk for traumatic brain injury, um, above average smoking rates, and high rates of associated medical conditions. So just to summarize um, this first section, which is you know really establishing that 
um, dementia is a, is a disparity disease um, in the indigenous population. There's an aging indigenous population with an elevated risk for dementia stemming mainly from related social and health disparities. In recent years, we've also seen this translate into higher rates of dementia. So I'm gonna transition now into our research on Alzheimer's and dementia with indigenous communities. And I'll talk um, briefly about our approach and then move into the key findings. It's been over a decade now since the increasing rates of dementia were becoming noticeable to indigenous communities. So my involvement in this research dates back to 2007. Um, when the First Nations communities I've been working with in um, Ontario um, for about eight years at the time, they um, came to us and let us know that they were seeing high rates of dementia in their communities, um, and they were interested in doing research on that. They mobilized some resources and held a roundtable with other Indigenous communities and organizations to talk about these increasing um, rates and what it was meaning for the delivery of services in their communities. That round table, which is like the 2007 graphic um, is the report there for that round table. It sparked over a decade of research now with those communities, um, which were now expanding into Minnesota and Wisconsin. Our overall approach to research is community-based participatory research. We call it CBPR, so we don't have to say that every time. Um, CBPR ensures that we're engaging with communities throughout the research process, that we give back to them through these partnerships, that we build local capacity for research as we carry out our activities, and that we're contributing to empowerment and self-determination in the communities we work with. On this slide, you can see the setup of a talking circle, and in the center of that is a medicine bundle. And this is to ensure what is shared in that talking circle is true and authentic, and that participants are reassured that the, state, the space is safe. When you authentically conduct CBPR research with Indigenous communities, it becomes clear quickly that CBPR alone is not enough and that indigenous methodologies are also needed. When engaged in this research, <clears throat> we continually reflect on the privilege that Western knowledge systems have and we make space for indigenous knowledge. Two-Eyed Seen is a model that we use to ensure that the research benefits from both knowledge systems and that that power imbalance that is there is consciously challenged. So we have come to use a two-eyed seeing model. And two-eyed seeing was first conceptualized and introduced by Mi'kmaq elder, Albert Marshall. And he explained that two-eyed seeing is a gift where we learn to see from one eye with the strengths of indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing, and from the other eye with the strengths of Western knowledge and ways of knowing. The other concept that's important today is this idea of translation. Um, so you can start thinking about translation as we move through the remainder of the slides. When you engage in CBPR and indigenous methodologies, the translation takes on many forms as you see on the slide. There's translation that occurs during the data collection process, which can include linguistic and cultural translations. Um, there's something that we call knowledge translation and exchange that occurs throughout the process as we engage with and learn from community organizations, from the leadership and from the advisory groups we work with. And then there's translational science where we move our research findings into practice. And so all of these are embedded in our work. So next I'll take you through some found foundational findings from data collected in Ontario. Um, this engaged six research sites that you can see on the slide. 
They were culturally and geographically diverse indigenous populations from across the province. Um, they were um, rural, there was a remote site, there were urban sites, um, and there was Cree, Ojibwe, Ojig Cree, and Haudenosaunee uh, participants as well. And so the findings, the data was collected, you know, from 2010 to 2014. And the analysis is about five years old now, but these findings were truly foundational and they've continued to shape our knowledge translation activities as well as our current research priorities. And I'm just briefly want to introduce you to one special research site, um, which is Manitoulin Island in Ontario, Canada, um, where we've worked more intensely over a longer period of time. Um, there's seven First Nations on Manitoulin Island. They're noted in the green color on the map. Um, and we've had partnerships with them for over 20 years um, and have been engaged with research concerning dementia with them um, since, the, since 2007. Um, Manitoulin Island is located on the North shore of Lake Huron and is connected to the mainland by a swing bridge when it works. <laughs> you can get stuck there. Um, quite a bit of the translational science work that we've done has been with these communities where we've been able to kind of work more intensely. So moving into our findings, I can give you the, the broad overview of what we learned. And basically what we learned is that there does exist an indigenous specific understanding of cognition and dementia. In all the regions we worked, there was a universal understanding of aging and dementia as an accepted and normal part of the life cycle. Um, there's a couple quotes here I'd like to read to you. The first is from a knowledge keeper from Six Nations, which is a Haudenosaunee community in Southern Ontario. Um, this knowledge keeper said, the code talks about it. It's more of a natural thing. It's not looked at as a disease, you know. Some people go back that way. This is how they're going back to the creator. And a knowledge keeper uh, who is Anishinaabe from Thunder Bay, which hopefully you all know where that is. It's three hours north of where I'm sitting. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, you know, abnormal does not mean, well, abnormal is normal to us. It's part of the human family. Everything is. Maybe they're the normal. I don't know. How do we know? Yeah, they don't hide anything. They carry the spirit of a little child. They laugh at inappropriate times or speak up at inappropriate times. And the words captured in the last text box, it's normal, it's natural, it's part of the circle of life and it's coming for full circle are the words that were commonly used by our participants to talk about dementia. We found no one who could think of words for dementia as an illness in their language. Um, and our subsequent work um, over the last few years with an expert Anishinaabe language group confirmed this for us. But there were lots of words to describe the symptoms and experiences. Um, and this said to us that, you know, if these words um, and concepts exist in, in the language, um, then they've been around for a while. So uh, we think that the dementia has, is not a new phenomenon in these communities but the magnitude maybe is. Uh, really important to our work is the notion that dementia is understood as returning to one's childhood was widely accepted. I'm gonna read you this quote from an older adult in Thunder Bay. The older people, they always refer to that term of going back into their childhood because they use the Anishinaabe word for that. And the term is koweya manonchawe. That's returning back to childhood. And bino in that word means baby. So I'm really quite aware that speaking of dementia as a return to childhood 
uh, stands in sharp contrast um, with what we're taught. And, you know, to those who study mainstream gerontology, even to the language advice of the Alzheimer's organizations. And really it's, you know, we're sort of taught that there's a risk of infanticizing older adults when we speak about dementia in that way. But the fact that there's an Anishinaabe word for such a process suggests that this understanding has substantial acceptance and deep cultural roots and meaning for indigenous people. In Anishinaabe cosmology, understandings of life and one's place in the universe are organized and understood through the medicine wheel teachings. In these teachings, when a person is born, they enter the world through the Eastern doorway. That's where you're a baby, that's the yellow. You travel through life, through adolescence and adulthood. And when you reach elderhood, you're positioned in the North. After elderhood, after that state of knowledge, you travel back to the Eastern doorway where the babies are born. Something just happened. Did you lose the... No, nope, it's back. That's better. <laughs> Sorry, I have no idea what that was. Um, so when you leave the, the north and, and, and travel um, after elderhood, you're traveling back to the place where babies are born, to the eastern doorway. And you exit through this doorway and you head across the medicine wheel and out the western doorway to the next life. Um, and this is why it's accepted if one returns to the childlike behaviors, as this is really meant to be part of the life's journey. And I just want to say that um, this is an indigenous teaching. And um, I'm sharing it with you because it was gifted to me by an elder. And I do have permission to, to share it. Some participants talked about words for the process of memories being buried or covered, but never being lost. And I just want to share a quick um, video where our community based researcher, Karen Pitawanaquit describes this. And that we view dementia as um, the person still has the knowledge that they had before, but at, that it's just buried inside. Um, we call it uh, so that's what that means, that it's just buried inside, that they're still who they were. And it's up to us to learn how to um, make their life a little better, a uh, little happier, um, happiness, feelings of happiness and feelings of love and familiarity are really important. Um, and that's, that's, how we, that's how we view dementia. So I think that's important for, for that to be understood. Okay, um, so again, a different way of thinking of dementia than some of us are used to, where um, it's all still there and we're all and we're still the same person. Um, you know, they're just they're just buried. We found that spirituality and culture were inseparable in people's approach to dementia and in their experiences of the symptoms of dementia. So those kinds of notions we discussed around the language of coming full circle or into a second childhood uh, were deeply rooted in the spiritual understandings of becoming closer to the creator and closer to that spiritual doorway or the place of transition, which is that Eastern doorway where people move through the portal of life and death. And so um, when people talked about the symptoms of what we would call hallucinations, they framed them as visions. And these visions were viewed as um, resulting from being close to that spirit world and close to the creator. Um, and they were not to be confused with hallucinations. So I'll read you this quote from one of our um, knowledge keepers and an Anishinaabe expert um, language speaker. Elders with dementia are in a time of preparation to leave this physical earth. 
When the elder with dementia is not making sense in conversation or talking about another place or time that's not being experienced by all those listening, their spirit's actually traveling and amongst their next life. These experiences are verbally passed on in stories and not considered hallucinations, but a real part of what we know as the circle of life. Um, and this had a lot of implications when people talked about uh, the care they were receiving from the mainstream services and um, having healthcare providers um, characterize these visions as hallucinations and becoming um, very offended by this. And in some cases, um, it would lead to them disengaging with health services completely because they, they felt they weren't they weren't understood. Um, they often talked about these uh, experiences as, as being sacred and learning moments, um, knowledge moments, information that needed to be passed on from the other side um, to, the pe to the people that were gonna be left behind. So I think, um, Many of us in this field may have heard examples from other cultures um, also describe dementia as, as normal or a second childhood. We even sometimes hear this from mainstream um, clients, I think. But I think what we're showing here and what's really unique in our findings is that um, we've been able to really show how this is embedded um, in, in in a cultural and spiritual grounding in their worldview and teachings. And they have, it's not coming from misunderstanding or a lack of knowledge and education in, in sort of Western medicine. They have a framework um, that's been there for a long time that's embedded in their language. They have a framework for the experience uh, of dementia. Culture and indigenous medicine were also identified as key strengths for dementia care. Um, they, there's a lot of examples. These are a few um, where participants were able to speak about how um, culture and medicine helped them with their self-care um, and caregiving. So a person with dementia from Thunder Bay shared, I just pray to the creator to take care of me, to look after me, help me out. Just pray, that's all. Light cedar, smudge, or make cedar tea, make Indian medicine. And in relationship to caregiving, um, a participant from Six Nations said, ah, I think what made it easier or more natural is that being Aboriginal, that's one of the traits, it's family care. And it, their culture and traditions and approaches to life also helped with healthy living. So it was linked to, you know, how do you, how does your brain age well? And this participant from one of our urban sites said, oh yes, because you can't participate in the spiritual activities if you drink or do drugs. I, and I don't know what it does dancing, not only lifts your spirits, but I guess brings up whatever you need in your mind, you know, what do you call those things like serotonins and chemicals? Yeah, it brings them up. Balance is the foundation of a good life in indigenous worldviews. Um, balance means well-being in um, the four quadrants of the medicine wheel, which is the physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional self. Not having access to the benefits of the culture is believed to put an individual out of balance and at risk for dementia. With our participants, colonialism was clearly linked to putting the population out of balance and to the increase in dementia prevalence. So this older adult um, from our Manitoulin Island site said, this elder said to me, you're out of balance, you know? When I first went to him for help, all he said was, you're out of balance. So I think that Alzheimer's is being out of balance for me anyways. That's why I look at it not as being able to function in a balanced way to your thoughts, your feelings, and your actions and acceptance. This is generally how the participants explained 
the fact that there's now increased rates of dementia um, and that that aspect of dementia isn't normal um, because something's out of balance. And also the fact that they're starting to see it at younger ages. Historical trauma in many forms was discussed. Um, this quote speaks to the impact of residential schools on the highly valued relationship between the elders and the youth. Um, residential schools um, were Canada's equivalent to the Indian boarding schools in the US. And so this traditional healer from Manitoulin uh, shared with us, she said, being around the kids is actually healing for the elderly too because you have the kids and they're engaging in new things with you all the time. So that's good for the memory. And so because a lot of the residential school incidents too, that's also affected the family dynamic. So you find a lot of grandparents just isolate themselves. So families are not doing their role as grandparents' roles, which actually keeps you young. So those disruptions that came with colonial policies disrupted the role of elders and that relation, important relationship between elders and youth. So it was a large ethnographic study and we covered a lot and I just have given you um, some highlights um, to help you understand the next section of, of the presentation. There were some additional findings and I just quickly wanna say that um, there was a lot of discussion about cross-cultural care and the experiences people had in clinical settings. Um, there was generally felt to be not a culturally appropriate or safe approach to care for people. Um, you can imagine why hearing some of those differences between Indigenous understandings of the illness and what we know to be the Western biomedical understandings. There were also access issues where people um, shared with us that the relationships um, that form between um, the patient and the physician or the nurse or the formal caregiver um, is really important. And when there's a lot of staff turnover, um, physicians come and go, you know, that the kinds of questions you get asked during a clinical interview around dementia people are not going to be willing to answer because they don't have a relationship with that person. And so that continuity of care um, was a huge problem at all of our research sites in Canada. And it really did have an impact on um, the kinds of experiences people were having and then whether or not they decided to engage with formal care at all. Um, and so this, these issues around access and care um, resulted in issues of underdiagnosis, potentially overdiagnosis because the practitioner was maybe not um, aware of um, the person and their circumstances didn't have that relationship. Frequent medication changes, every time they got a new physician, they said they got a drug um, and definitely mistrust, which sort of led to poor adherence or disengagement with medical systems. So just to summarize this second section, um, the experience of dementia and aging are grounded in indigenous knowledge and culture. And at times this knowledge and language is in conflict with biomedical knowledge. Understanding and translating indigenous experiences and knowledge of dementia presents opportunities for us to improve care and culture is healing. There's a need to develop and support appropriate and culturally safe care strategies for older indigenous adults. Um, I'll just pause here before we go to the last section on the knowledge translation projects um, and ask Stacy if at this point there's any questions or raised hands. Uh, I don't see any questions at the moment, but I'll let you know if any come up. Okay. Um, so yes, we'll transition now. Um, and I'll tell you about some of what we've done with the findings that I've just shared with you uh, and talk about knowledge translation. 
The first uh, translation I'm going to talk about is in the area of dementia education and prevention. So this first example has to do with the creation of dementia fact sheets for Indigenous people in Canada. Um, these were developed by our team in partnership with um, Health Canada. We drew heavily on the findings from the projects I was just sharing with you. And we continued through the process to work closely with Indigenous advisors and elders um, as we tried to navigate some of the nuances with, with this and um, the cultural and linguistic translations that we had to go through in building these fact sheets. Um, like I said, this was in partnership with Health Canada, who was interested in producing um, a series of fact sheets that could be used across Canada. So for really diverse First Nations communities and the other provinces. Um, so we used our findings and then we also looked at a handful of studies that have been done in other provinces, which was only British Columbia and Saskatchewan, um, to make sure that what we were saying was kind of resonating across the board. And then we had the opportunity um, to work with Health Canada's Indigenous Home and Community Care Program workers who were embedded in communities all over the country. And so we were able to sort of present drafts and get feedback um, on the fact sheets just to ensure that those workers felt that our materials would resonate nationally. Um, it's quite a process to move from creating something, you know, that's specific to one cultural group to, um, to trying to do something that, that, that will resonate with diverse cultural groups. Uh, it was a real interesting project. Um, and our goal was to produce something that was culturally appropriate across all of these, these groups to increase dementia awareness and promote access to care in a way that didn't disrupt Indigenous understandings of dementia. And that's really what was going to make these different than what was already out there from the Alzheimer's Society. So the project resulted in the creation of five national fact sheets. And then one, which is the medicine wheel image on there, that was specific um, for the Anishinaabe partners on Manitoulin Island. And they, they requested that specifically. They wanted the preventing dementia um, fact sheet presented as a medicine wheel uh, for their communities. Um, interestingly, the CDC recently launched their Healthy Brain Initiative uh, Roadmap for Indian Country in the US. Um, and they actually refer to our um, website and to our fact sheets, since there's nothing comparable in the, in the United States. Um, there's the website down here at the bottom of the page where these can be freely downloaded if you're interested. Um, if you do have time to review them, you'll see that the fact sheets privilege indigenous understandings um, and draw on Indigenous teachings, and that what we've done is use the real life experiences from, from people, uh, Indigenous people in the communities we worked with as the examples um, in these. So something like signs and symptoms, which you think, how could you really make that culturally appropriate? Um, it's kind of like the difference between, do you have trouble programming your thermostat, which most people don't have, um, you know, to asking maybe a question about the wood stove instead. A second translation um, is in the area of clinical care and diagnosis. This is the publication that Phyllis referred to in the introduction. Um, and this was uh, the development of uh, culturally appropriate and safe 
dementia case finding tool. Um, in this case, for use with Anishinaabe people, we started this project on um, with the seven First Nations on Manitoulin Island. Those previous findings I was sharing with you had revealed that these clinical encounters um, were not very positive and were causing people to avoid care. Um, we have a whole set of findings on people's reactions to and um, experiences with uh, clinical screening tools. Um, and basically what we found was that the patients were dissatisfied and offended and the physicians told us they didn't work with their indigenous clients. So we made it a priority in the next stage of our research to, um, to take on this adaptation um, study. And so we undertook an adaptation of what's called the Kimberly Indigenous Cognitive Assessment. Um, and the communities and the research team were comfortable with this tool since it had been developed um, in partnership with indigenous populations in the Kimberley region in Australia. And for this adaptation, um, we used an iterative research and translation process back and forth between community and, um, and researchers, uh, where we had a advisory group in the community, and then we had a group of expert Anishinaabe language speakers, our, and then our team members. And then we also had a panel of healthcare providers. And each of those groups at, at various times um, were engaged with the process and they went through the assessment tool uh, domain by domain. And um, it was primarily the Anishinaabe language group that would go through and adjust the questions to reflect the local cultural understandings and nuances within the Anishinaabe language. And then that would come back to, to those with more of a biomedical lens um, and adjustments would have to be made. And we just went through the process until we got it right. Um, once we thought we had it right, we piloted the tool with uh, 10 participants and then we had to revise it a little bit. Um, we eventually got to a final version and, um, and then we initiated a study to, to validate the instrument. And so the, that whole process um, and the adaptation is captured in that recent publications in Innovations in Aging. And the validation study has just currently been submitted and is under review. Um, and then we worked with our advisory group to develop training materials and training videos, um, all of which are freely available on our eye care website um, at the top of the slide. Uh, and the advisory group um, members are the stars of the training videos. There's four training videos. There's an English version, a National Bay Moen version, a sign language, sign language version, and then a version where um, that would help you if you were conducting the assessment with a translator. And it's just been incredible uptake of this tool across Canada. We, we monitor the downloads on the site and we collect information from people who are downloading. Um, and there's so much interest for this project here with the communities we're working with. So we're just in the process now on, of working on an NIH grant application to transition this tool to US populations. Um, the third translation is an art-based cultural, um, cultural teachings on dementia. Um, for this translation, um, it's kind of currently in progress. We haven't finished it, but I'd like to quickly share with you that um, we wanted to undertake a project that would allow us to understand and translate in multiple forms Indigenous knowledge keepers' teachings about dementia. So we interviewed more deeply six traditional knowledge keepers on Manitoulin Island. Um, those interviews were done in Anishinaabe Moen and then translated to English. Um, for the research team. The original recordings of the interviews were shared with a language speaker and a local knowledge keeper and artist, Leland Bell. 
He listened to the recordings and discerned what he felt were the key teachings and created a visual representation for each interview um, of what he thought the key teaching was from that knowledge keeper. And um, this is these are pictures of Leland Bell sharing those paintings and his interpretations with our advisory group. We gifted the original pieces of art back to the knowledge keepers. Um, and so here are those pieces, and you've already seen them, actually, because I've scattered them throughout the presentation. And I was able to do that because once they were completed, they actually mapped back on to the key themes that have been relevant to our entire trajectory um, in our dementia research path. We are still in progress with this one. Re uh, recently, Leland Bell completed a final piece where he listened to all the interviews again and has, has combined them into one overall painting. And we're excited. We plan to use the paintings and teachings to create learning materials on each of the topics to help people with dementia and their caregivers. And we think they might also be useful for teaching younger generations about dementia. So we'll work with our local advisory group to think about how to best use these. And they're just beautiful. So I'm just about finished. This is my third summary point. Translation's a theme throughout our research. Um, it manifests in different forms along our path. Um, our projects concerning dementia have involved linguistic and cultural translations, knowledge translation and exchange, and translational science. For our team, working cross-culturally has benefited from the two-eyed seeing philosophy, which has allowed us to respectfully discuss and translate concepts and understandings from different cultural perspectives. Um, I'll do this last couple slides in about two minutes, and then we'll have time for questions. Um, I did move to Minnesota three and a half years ago, and I am up on the North Shore um, in Duluth. We are now sort of at the end of this path, but you can see the arrow goes on. Um, for the past two years, we've been funded by uh, the NIA through an R56 mechanism to begin a program of research called ICARE, Indigenous Cultural Understandings of Alzheimer's Disease and Related Dementias, Research and Exchange. And for this project, we're seeking to implement a similar ethnographic qualitative study as we had done in Canada, but this time uh, to include US tribal populations. And also with an expanded set of research questions uh, that allow us to understand indigenous experiences across the disease trajectory. So we've just, we've become a little bit more sophisticated over time in our thinking about this. In the first phase with the R56 funding, we were able to establish research partnerships with tribal communities in Minnesota and Wisconsin. So that's Red Lake and Grand Portage in Minnesota and Oneida in Wisconsin, and reaffirmed our partnerships on Manitoulin Island. Um, we established research infrastructure in these communities and did some pilot interviewing and focus groups that we're analyzing now. And we just um, we're awarded an R01 to continue the project for the next five years. We'll be focused on analyzing the lived experience of dementia from the perspective of people with dementia and their caregivers in these three diverse regions around the Great Lakes. Um, and this time we want to look more purposely at um, the experiences at the different stages of dementia. We want to look at Indigenous specific meanings of quality of life and appropriate clinical care. Um, and just like what I've just shared, you know, embedded in all of this is translation of this knowledge into appropriate tools for communities and families. And it's really exciting because March 1st is our actual start date. So today is the day. Um, so thanks again for taking time to hear about our projects and our work today. And I'm happy to take any questions. I'll stop sharing unless uh, and we can bring the slide back up if people have specific questions on slides. Just to remind uh, you, can either unmute yourself or use the raise hand function if you have a question. 
Yes, so uh, this is Phyllis Jacqueline. I really enjoyed your presentation and I've always thought that um, translation is key on so many levels and I liked all the levels that you talked about. But my question is about if you could uh, talk more about continuity of care, both across when the uh, care providers change, but also across groups of caregivers that are theoretically working together. It's been my experience that oftentimes they are asking the Alzheimer's patient the same questions over and over again, not connecting with one another or the knowledge mm -hmm. that they have. Yeah, thanks, Phyllis. Um, in, in, there's some differences between I've learned between the Canadian healthcare system and American healthcare system. And so when we talk about continuity of care in the context of First Nations communities in Canada, it's it's quite unique. Um, and there there is constant turnover. Um, you know, some of the communities maybe had um, were lucky to have family physicians that had been there more than 10 years, but um, that that wasn't really the norm. And anybody in kind of an urban center, they just weren't able to usually see the same provider um, each time that they they went in. Um, family medicine in particular, to have a family doctor in one of these communities is extraordinary. Um, and and so that's where a lot of dementia care happens in these communities. There is not access to specialized care or dementia care teams or memory clinics or anything like that. So a lot of this was being done by primary health care um, family physicians. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it had more, it, it had less to do with the repetition of questions, although that did come up. Um, a, a great frustration and having to repeat their story when the new doctor came to town. Um, but also just not wanting to divulge what they felt as like really personal information. One participant um, from a remote community told us that her mother was asked um, at what age she went through menopause. And, and that was the end of the conversation. They, they left um, because that was not considered an appropriate question when you hadn't established a relationship with the person. Um, so I think that, you know, that that's kind of the context of it, which might be a little bit different here in terms of care teams. The care was it's improved since this this time because the, the research really sparked an interest in doing better um, at the community level. So so now they're you know, some of the communities have like a um, an aging care coordinator position that kind of helps. Um, navigate these things, but there really weren't teams um, working on this in these communities. My question is, how did you get interested in this and involved in this in the first place? What's sort of the deep background behind this major um, and multi-year en endeavor? Um, thanks. I... Uh... I did my training, um, my PhD training was in community-based participatory research. So I kind of made a commitment early in my career to be responsive to community uh, needs and community direction on, on the projects they wanted to work on. And um, I, I can say, and um, other people that are in this field would understand this, sometimes you're more passionate about some of these projects than others. and. Um, this particular research was one that was that that was completely driven by the community. They were the ones that noticed that this was becoming an issue and nobody was doing anything about it. And because I had been working with them uh, for many years, they invited me to that first round table that I talked about. And it was from there that um, they invited me to go on this dementia research journey with them. I, I can say that um, it really resonated with me. And, um, you know, 
I've spent a lot of time reflecting on, on, on why that is, but I, I do have a, um, dementia is something that is in my family and that I experienced growing up, um, in many different ways it, it, it entered my life. And since starting down this path, I've been a lot of memories have come back, um, about, uh, the time I spent with people with dementia in my childhood. So, um, you know, it just, it was a, per, I guess it was a perfect match. And, 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 and so I'm just thrilled that when I came to Minnesota, that communities here as well saw this as a huge priority and have really wanted to continue on this, this journey with me. Thank you. Well, we greatly appreciate your coming and we have your uh, contact information if people have other questions. And uh, so pleased that you introduced your research project to us. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks for having me. And thanks everybody for coming. <laughs>